There is one more peculiarity with this process. That's why I chose the polytron, not the electron. <coughs> because in discussing, in calculating the electron mu scattering, we gave the Feynman rules for an incoming fermion, not an anti-fermion. That's called U of, let's say, P. As in, as incoming. This is for a fermion. But if you have an anti-fermion, just like in this case, electron is a fermion, fermion, positron is an anti-fermion. You have an incoming electron. Well, there are two ways you can do that. You can either say, okay, let's put a V. This moment, moment is P and an S. This is for anti-fermion. But then, of course, you have to remember what the properties of V are. But rather than doing this, I prefer to use, instead of an incoming anti-fermion, you can imagine an outgoing in the opposite direction, fermion with four moments minus. So we already know what to put in a Feynman diagram when we have such a piece. This is U of minus D, this is a polarization test. Now this is U bar. So wherever you have a anti-fermion line, just reverse the direction of the arrow and three. And reversing the direction of the arrow just means changing the sign of these four vectors and treat it as a fermion. So this will be the calculation. Of course, this is one of the diagrams. There is a second one that you should figure out. And again, this is for Monday. Now let's continue. Up to now we have been studying the lowest order processes, the cross the Feynman diagram that has the minimum number of vertices. But we can increase the number. We were studying P minus P minus scattering. We had drawn that at lowest order. We have this diagram. Electron neon. So what happens is we can start from the electron. Electron emits a photon, which is absorbed by the muon, and you are done. And then this can the exchange moment. Or we can have the electron comes. Okay, it emits a photon. But this photon breaks into an electron positron pair, which then annihilate each other, creating the original photon. And this photon is absorbed by the muon. This is another possible process. Or you have an electron that emits a photon, that emits a second photon, which is absorbed by the muon. And after it emits this photon, which is absorbed by the muon, it reabsorbs the photon that it had emitted before. Of course, the muon can do the same thing. The electron comes, it emits the photon. The muon comes, first it emits the photon, continues and absorbs the photon emitted by the electron, scatters and absorbs the photon that it emitted itself. Or we can have, there is an electron comes, it emits a photon, and it emits, after some time, it emits another photon. The muon first absorbs this first photon, and then it absorbs the other photon. But the electron comes, it emits one photon, then emits another photon. The muon comes, it first absorbs the photon emitted here, and then absorbs the photon, the first photon emitted by the electron. So if you look at these processes, all of these processes have one, two, three, four vertex, one, two, three, four vertex, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, there. They all contain four vertices. So these, all of these diagrams 
This, is, this was proportional to e squared, which is alpha. This diagram is of the order of alpha. All of these diagrams are of the order of e to the 4, which is alpha squared. Now also remember that alpha is 1 over 100 and so power of 10 to power minus. So the contributions of these diagrams to our cross-section will be of the order of a few percent compared to this one. So should you calculate this, these diagrams or not depends on what is the precision in your experiment. If, like in electrodynamics, where most, there are quantities that are calculated up to one part in 10 to the power 10, of course you need to calculate these and even more. But if you are not interested in making predictions that are as precise, that are more precise than a few percent, you can just ignore these. So that depends on with what are you trying to compare your predictions. Now, how to calculate these then? So I will restrict myself to this one only. Well, the rules to calculate these diagrams, the other diagrams, are the same. The rules are the same. So you, you pick up any fermion line, you start from the end, and at, at the end, you, for this diagram, for example, for this line, you start from the end, you have a U bar, let's put the label for labels all the beta mean. Then you come to a vertex which has the label beta, so it is R, E, gamma, beta. Then you continue along the line, so here you have a fermion line connecting two points, so you just put your propagator is called this moment P. I P squared plus N divided by P squared minus H squared. Then you have this fermion propagator on your way that connects these two points. Let's call this moment P pi. Oh, we have this vertex. We, we wrote this line. There is this vertex appearing over there. So you have I P gamma mu. You have this fermion propagator I P prime slash plus N divided by P squared minus N squared. And then you have this vertex, which is R E gamma alpha. And you have the ingoing electron, which is Q. This is a long expression. But to write down this expression, it just takes you a few minutes, a few seconds, a few minutes. Once you know the Feynman rules, any diagram, the, the expression corresponding to any diagram, you can just immediately write down. Now, but uh, this is, by the way, just for this line. You have the second line, you also have these photon propagators with which you have multiplied this expression there. Now let's come to this one. Because this has one more ingredient in it. We have here, we have a, what's called a fermion loop. Well, here we have three fermion lines. We have this fermion line, that's also called mu, mu, this alpha, theta. We have this fermion line, which is the same as the fermion line appearing over here. So the expression is also identical. You will have u bar, i, e, gamma, mu, u. I'm not writing the moment over this, but they're also there. We have this fermion line for the mu. This is for the electron. U bar for the mu. I e gamma mu u mu. So we are done with this fermion line. We are done with this fermion line. By the way, the calculation of this part of this diagram only. Is what gave Schumacher his Nobel Prize. Now let's come back here. So we are done with these two fermion lines. So here we have the third fermion line, but this is a loop, so it doesn't have an end. So if you have a loop of fermion lines, you can start from wherever you like. I will choose from this line. 
this program. Let's also suppose that this photo has moment of Q. Let's call this formula, the momentum of this formula is K. So the, an electron comes that has momentum K. It absorbs the photon with momentum Q, so its momentum becomes K plus Q. So it emits the photon with momentum Q over here. So at each vertices, the momentums are conserved. So let's start with this one. I k slash plus divided by k squared minus x squared. This is this one. So we have the arrow, so we are going backwards. We start from this one. Going backward, we arrive at this at this vertex, which is I E. Gamma beta. And then once we have this vertex, we have this propagator. It is a fermion with momentum k plus q. I k plus k slash plus q slash plus m divided by k plus q squared minus m squared. And then I have this vertex over there which is I E gamma alpha. This is alpha, this is beta. So I close the loop. Now whenever you have a loop, you just multiply the corresponding gamma matrices and take the trace. And, well, this is a, a fermion loop. So for the fermion loops, you just write down the corresponding expressions, take the trace of the product that correspond to the this fermion line that forms the loop, and also multiply with a minus one. So why did you do that? Hmm? Why did you do that? Those are same rules. So it is, in a sense, it is just like remember in the in the morning session we were calculating the products of gamma matrices and when we map in calculating things squared. We ended up having the same index, a product, and we have the AA, or L. Coming over the AA, L just gave us the trace. But in the formal derivation of these Feynman rules, you'll see that in this loop, if you start from a point which corresponds to having some L in a matrix L, then you come to the same matrix L. So this loop, contribute the AA element of this product, some overall A, which is the trace. And this minus one is there because of the fermionic property. If you have, well, in terms of the operator, the fermionic operator, they undiagonate, they do not compute. And then what we are missing is, we are missing this photo propagator over here, which is <laughs> minus I, d mu alpha divided by q squared minus i g nu beta divided by q squared. And what is the value of k? Well, it can have any value. The important thing is that we conserve energy momentum at each vertex. But for all values of k, we are conserving energy and momentum at each vertex. So all values of k are possible, so we have to sum over all possible amplitudes, all possible values of k. E for k divided by 2 times 2. So these are the corresponding amplitudes for this side.
So if you look at this photon propagator, by the way, it should remind you of something from the, your last lecture. So we are creating a photon here, and we are looking at the probability that it will go over here. This is nothing but the two-point function that you have discussed like an hour ago. And in fact, we are now calculating the two-point function of the photon. So we have seen that the first correction, this is the two-point function, the lowest order, the two-point function of the photon is minus i p mu divided by q squared. And now we also have this curve over here, which I can write in short form. I have this fault, this propagator, minus i g alpha mu over q squared. And I have that integral over there, whatever the value is for the time being, I will just write some pi alpha mu. And if you look at the expression for the integral, it depends on the masses and only on Q. It doesn't depend on when, when we are integrate over K, there, there can be no K dependence. So this pi alpha beta depends only on Q. And then we have this other part over here. Minus pi G beta mu divided. I can imagine similar diagram to this one. I can have, okay, this part I'm no longer interested in. I have one fermion loop. The photon, it forms another fermion loop. Another photon, which scatters the mu. If we put the indices, we have mu, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, mu. So this loop is identical to this loop. They are integral to the loop. Exactly the same. The only difference will be the indices. Here I have the alpha beta index, here I have the gamma delta index. So if I write only this part, I'm not writing the muon line or the electron line or the muon line. I'm just writing this what connects the two. Plus, minus i, the alpha mu divided by q squared pi alpha beta. To minus i g beta mu over q squared pi. Now beta connects gamma, beta gamma, q squared. Here I have the same loop integral with indices gamma and delta. And then I have this piece over here, minus i g delta mu over q squared. And if you want, you can go up to infinity. Like this. I can also imagine, like just repeating this single loop, I can also imagine diagrams like the photon leaves this point. It makes a loop. This is what we have written over here. This is there. But the formula within this loop, they can also exchange photons. I can do the same thing for the other diagram. Well, you can complicate that as much as you like. Uh, the limit to the complication of this diagram is, is your imagination. But we usually what we do is we just collect these diagrams. So I will specify the criteria for collecting them and label them one part to irreducible diagrams. Now the difference between if you look at this diagram and this diagram, this just looking at this piece. In this diagram, if I remove, remove a single particle line, if I remove this line, it becomes two disconnected pieces. This one. Or if I look at this one over here. If I remove this one, if I remove all of these particles, it becomes two disconnected pieces. But this one, no matter which line I remove, I'm allowed to remove only one line, not more. 
it is still one piece. I cannot divide this diagram into more than one piece by uh, selecting out a single line. So that's what we call one particle irreducible diagram. So what this, what I put here as pi alpha beta will be, in fact, the sum of all possible one particle irreducible diagrams, not just this one. This is the lowest old order diagram that contributes to this pi alpha beta. Okay, fine. So we have a kind of an infinite series. An infinite series is kind of useful stuff unless you can just estimate it somehow. Let's look at what we can do if we multiply these indices or to become of them.
And if you look at this expression, if you multiply both side by Q alpha, what do you end up having? You have Q squared by 1 Q beta plus pi 2 of Q squared Q beta. This should be equal to 0. Which tells us that pi 2 of Q squared has to be equal to minus Q squared pi 1 of Q squared. So these two functions, pi 1 and pi 2, they have to be related with each other. They are not independent from each other. But from now on, since at the end I don't really care about these terms over here, I will pick only the G. If the first term is G mu, I will pick only the G mu terms. I ignore all the rest. So if I take only the term that doesn't contain this Q alpha Q beta piece, what I have here, let's, let's write this as B mu. Or B unit B of Q squared T unit. This is my this is the definition. So what this D is I have minus I over Q squared. That is the first part. D of Q squared, let's keep the G in the This is equal to minus I E mini divided by Q squared, the first term, plus minus I E mini alpha divided by Q squared. Minus I over Q squared where, well, what this G will do, it will just raise this T alpha beta in the set upwards. So I will have T mu nu over here. But T mu nu is nothing but Q squared by Q squared times T mu nu. Is this quite clear? I have this minus i over q squared term squared. I have two of them, one here, one here. This g alpha mu and this g beta mu will just raise these in this upward. I'm, I'm only keeping the g mu nu piece. q mu q nu piece, piece, I don't really care. I, mean, I will just omit the q mu q nu piece. And then I have this term over here. I have three factors of minus i over q squared. One, two, three. <coughs> Plus minus i over q squared q. Here I have t. Instead of alpha, I will just put mu. Instead of beta, I put gamma. So p mu gamma. p mu gamma. If I only pick up the g mu nu piece, g mu gamma, q square, q squared, pi q squared, mu gamma. And then I have this piece over here, pi gamma delta. Pi gamma delta, again I just picked the g mu nu part, is G gamma delta Q squared by two by Q squared. I have two factors of that. And finally I have this G delta G. If you multiply this with this G with this G, you end up having G mu. Okay. So this is equal to Minus i in mu divided by q squared. I just take one, one of these factors out. 
what is left 1 plus minus i over q squared times q squared pi of q squared. It is this term over here. Plus minus i over q squared times q squared pi q squared both of it multiplied squared. Uh, if I had written down the next term, it shouldn't be hard now to guess what the third term will be. The third term will be just the next term will be minus i over q squared, q squared pi q squared, raised to the power 3, and so on. So the q squared, they will just cancel. So what is left is minus i g minus divided by q squared. And if you know this series, this is 1. If you go all of this x, 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4 plus x to the 5, which is nothing but the Taylor series of 1 over 1 minus x. X is just minus i by two squares. Can I ask something? Sure. We were kind of only calculating the and for the diagram is one loop, then how do we end up saying <laughs> contribution <laughs> <laughs> of all the diagram is like all loops through to and what? Well, if you want to make a precise calculation, you have to calculate everything. An exact like calculation loop. Why do we only calculate the diagram uh, one loop? And loops then, I mean, there are many different diagrams. We are calculating them, all of them. Now, in fact, this is. This is the sum of all possible diagrams that contribute to the, to the propagation of a photon from one point to the other point. Let me show it with a thick wire. Okay, this is just a photon part. This is just a photon part. I'm not touching the other part. If I want to calculate the exact amplitude for the scattering, I have to calculate everything. But for, a, for a, the reason which I hope I will be able to reach at the end of the lecture, I'm now interested in this one. And although I started from a particular diagram, I kind of generalized my approach. Like that this, is, this sum contains the contribution of all diagrams to this uh, two-point two function. So it turns out that we don't really need to cal calculate everything. If we calculate the diagrams, we can just put it over here and it gives us the contribution of all diagrams, not just one part of the reducible box, but also the rest.
there's like a shifted. So one will be, let's say, over here. The other one is over here. So these are the locations of the poles. And I'm integrating over the real axis. Again, if you go back to complex analysis, we know that if we are considering an integral in the complex plane, you can deform your contour as much as you like, as long as you don't cross any of these poles, any of the poles of your integral. So I can use this property and just pick up my contour and rotate it like this. If I rotate it, I'm not crossing any of the poles. So the value of my integral doesn't change. So it just tells me that instead of integrating from minus infinity to <coughs> plus infinity, I can integrate this k0 from minus i infinity to plus i infinity. So this is equal to this integral. It is equal to the integral from minus i infinity to plus i infinity dk0 divided by 2 by 1 over whatever you have over there. But usually we don't like to have imaginary numbers in our integration language. So we define a new variable. I define k0 to be i k0 tilde. If I define k0 to be i k0 tilde, here I end up having i. I'm now integrating over k0 tilde over 2 pi. I'm going from minus infinity to plus infinity. 1 over k0 minus k0 tilde squared minus omega k squared minus k0 tilde plus, I do the same redefinition for q0, q0 tilde squared minus omega k plus q squared. In this expression, I can set epsilon equal to 0. Here, I cannot set epsilon equal to 0 because when epsilon is equal to 0, the point where k0 is equal to omega k, where this denominator is 0, is within my integration range. But once I do this transformation, if I put epsilon is equal, even if I put epsilon equal to zero, my denominator is never zero. So there's no problem. The integral is still well defined in the limit epsilon is equal to zero. <laughs> now this process is usually called a weak rotation. But I can take this minus sign out. So this is plus. So I have a minus sign from here, another minus sign from this parenthesis, so it gives me a plus sign. So the advantage of this rotation is that here, my denominator, my integral, could be both negative and positive, and it even diverged at some point within my integration range. So I don't really know, I don't really know how to calculate it. But here, my integral is always positive. It is never negative, it never diverges, it's always positive. So it's easier to deal with this integral. This is just a mathematical. These terms? Hmm? This one? Yes. It's just this term. But now, since these ones have an additional i, i squared is a minus one. So I have a minus in front of this, minus in front of this. That's the this term over here. Uh, if we come back to this integral over here, 
I will denote by k tilde squared just the notation. It is k0 tilde squared minus plus k squared now. By this rotation, we got rid of that minus sign over there. And d4 k tilde is dk0 tilde d2k. This is, again, just a notation. So with this notation, my integral over here
So we have x plus x bar, but x bar is just 1 minus x. So it is just the sum is k to the square. Plus from here, I get 2 k to the q to the x. And the rest is, I have m squared x, m squared x bar. It is just m squared plus q tilde squared x bar. Which I can also write as k tilde plus q tilde x, everything squared. If I take this square, I have k tilde squared plus twice k tilde q tilde x, this term over here. But I also have an additional q tilde squared x squared, which I subtract. Plus m squared plus q tilde squared x bar. Oh, by the way, sorry, this k tilde q tilde comes from this term, so it has an x bar. So this is x bar, this is x bar squared. And this is k tilde plus q tilde x bar squared plus q tilde squared x bar x this term and this term and I sum them up I end up having x x bar plus n squared. This is the denominator over here. Minus 
I just, I skip several steps. We can find the steps in the notes, but this is the answer. Now we have a problem, a serious problem. And this is in fact why I put, put to calculate this in D dimension. This double function. So the definition of the gamma function is gamma n is equal to dt from 0 to infinity e to the power n minus 1 e to the power minus 2. This is the definition. And its property is gamma n is equal to n minus 1 gamma n minus 1. And for integer numbers, gamma n is just n minus 1. Factorial. It's nothing about the generalization of factorial. But it is also defined for any real number, positive or negative, integer or non integer. If you plot it as a function of its arguments, that's a take as a of it, it behaves like this. It looks like this on the positive real side. In the negative real side, It looks something like this. This is minus 1, this is minus 2, this is minus 3. So if its argument is 0 or negative integer, it diverges to infinity. So if you, if you look at here, if we just put d is equal to 4, then this is 4 over 2 is 2, 2 minus 2 is 0, gamma of 0, gamma of 0 is infinity. Divergence. Now, in the beginning, in this, in the whole philosophy of this perturbation series, is that in for an exact calculation, we have to calculate everything, infinite domain terms. But if the higher order terms are smaller, we say that all these new diagrams that we are calculating should be of the order of a few percent of the leading term, the first three-level, so-called three-level diagram. Everything should be fine. But now we see that this one of the diagrams at least is infinitely large. So this just doesn't make sense. We are stuck. Uh, we, there, there should be something seriously wrong with what we are doing. Now let me see. I will not need this part. over here, minus i e mu over q squared 1 over 1 plus i pi of q squared. So we assume that the higher order terms should be small. They turn out to be infinite. But if we sum them up, all of them, this we are calculating this one over here, pi of q squared. This is infinite, so it seems that there is no contribution as well. Now let's go back to our original idea of perturbation theory. Let's go to the origin, the Lagrangian. And 
we have already <laughs> shown that if d dimension means the four minus d two pi to the d, this is equal to i mu to the power four minus d divided by four pi to the power d over two dx one over delta to two minus d over two delta. Two minus d over two, and delta this, sorry, this is delta squared. This delta squared is q squared plus x squared plus n squared. This is the result we have on the plan. Is 
square root of z3, z3 a mu is 0. So at the end, when I do this, what I end up having is I have almost the original quadratic. I define this thing 
evaluated as a part of uh, the experiments as some energy. So you do this experiment at the energy when q squared is, let's say, minus q squared. Okay, fifth homework. You should prove that q squared in this process is less than zero. In a, in a scattering process, q squared is zero, less than zero. It is negative. So I cannot define it as positive scales, some negative scale. Let's put the renormalization here. I define this thing, this whole combination, evaluate that this value to be equal to, exactly equal to, 4 pi times alpha evaluated at this scale divided by or equal to pi divided by the R. This is the definition. Or, in another words, I can say that alpha evaluate that we are first. What is this? Now, this is equal to saying that pi of q squared evaluate that q squared is equal to minus we are squared to be equal to zero. Well, I, how will this help me? I mean, this is something I'm calculating. How can I impose conditions on it? Well, remember, now we are, we are making this separation. And I'm calculating the two-point function for the photon. So I have a photon coming here and leaving this point and going to the other part. I'm calculating the corrections to it due to, let's say, this part. If this is my Lagrangian, this is my, uh, this, this part is my three part class, and all the remaining terms are my interactions. If I, if I want to calculate the photon propagated, I have this first piece plus the piece that contributes to pi of q squared. This piece, this is the one part of the really useful part. Now I also have this one. If you will remember the expression, recall the expression for a mu, this term <laughs> contains products of two a mu. So at a given point, this term just gives me a photon coming in. Something happens to it due to this term. And the photon continues without really feeling anything. This is the part which we have been calculating over here. Uh, we have to take the traces and then put this result inside and it diverges this part. Well, this part, well, but if we look at here, this is a part proportional to delta 2. So this is, here I get a contribution from delta 2. Well, the explicit expression will probably be because we will have the mu and mu indices delta 2, q mu, q mu, q mu, minus q squared, q mu. This will be the form of this term over here, the factors of i. This is the same one rule corresponding to this term. Well, what is this delta 2? Well, it is up to me to choose this delta 2. In particular, I can choose my delta 2 such that pi of q squared, let's say, in this new theory, pi of q squared is pi of q squared minus 
minus mu r squared. This is the part that comes from the two. That the two, the, the separate, the initial separation partition of one was completely arbitrary. It was up to me to how to choose this that one to two and three. And so I use that freedom to choose that the two to be such that this pi tilde, the one particle irreducible diagram of this theory. is 0 when q squared is equal to minus r squared. So it saves my life at this. I got rid of the divergences here. Now, we said this theory. We said the first, this theory is the same as the original theory. I haven't made any change. It is just I rearrange my perturbation theory. With this perturbation theory, everything is now finite. Every, every physical quantity is now finite. Every observable quantity is now finite. But there's an artifact to that. So this is now here. This is, I should do the same calculation in new theory. Now I can define an alpha q squared is nothing but Whatever this e squared is, e squared over 1 minus i pi tilde q squared. This is my defined structure constant if I measure it at this given q squared. But the problem is now, well, not the real problem, but well, I know that, well, sorry, this is. This is the alpha at the value of minus mu r squared. So if I put, instead of q squared, I put minus mu r squared, this is 0. So the alpha of q squared at any value, if I define it like this, it has a q squared value. It changes with q. So that is what we call the running of the fine structure. Well, try to calculate this thing. I will not give this a homework, but do it on your own. You know almost everything to calculate these integrals, obtain this phi q squared, and obtain this phi tilde q squared. And once you obtain this phi tilde of q squared, you will see how alpha of q squared changes the fact. Changes this the energy. I didn't have enough time to finish that calculation, but I do advise you to go over it on your own. The calculations are in the lecture notes. So your shuttle will be waiting for you. So that is the only reason why I couldn't take half an hour more. You are so sorry for that.